like, Thomas, you need to do it better. And I just didn't do it, didn't lean into it. But one of the first songs I learned was Oh Holy Night to Play. And I actually played it in duet with my mother, which is like, this is crazy to go back to these memories. But how cool it is, Christmas. I mean, the sanctuary is so beautiful, and it's this time of year. And so I thought it would be interesting over these next uh, three Sundays uh, to lean into just a conversation centered around the various carols that we know well. Um, one of the things you did probably, those of you that had a cell phone, and we had your cell phone number, we texted you on Friday and said, hey, if you want to follow along, there's actually a, a devotional that you can do through YouVersion. Um, and if you need that link again, actually, you can bring it up on the YouVersion app this morning. There's a link there. Uh, just to follow along each day, looking at uh, different Christmas songs, not just uh, the ones we know so well, but others that maybe would encourage you just to think about Christmas in a fresh new way. And so I hope you'll do that. And it's kind of cool because there's actually a, a component where I've already made a couple comments each day. There's an opportunity for you to sort of respond with what God might be saying to you as you read the devotion for the day and as you think about that song, maybe the memory. And I would encourage each of you, to, to those of you that would be willing to join in, it could be kind of fun. I think you have already had some fun doing it, but join us. Uh, I think it'll be a great way to look at Christmas. So, um, Oh Holy Night, let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, it's a song that actually was written in the mid-1800s. There was a parish priest in France uh, who asked a, a, a famous uh, French wine merchant and a poet to um, take and see if he could write a poem based upon Luke chapter 2. Now what's interesting about this is this particular guy, his name was Plessy Chapu, uh, I think I said that right, hopefully I didn't butcher his name, but he, he was known as a hellraiser. So it's really interesting that this priest asked this gentleman to, to see if he could come up with the words. So that's where the words of Holy Night came from. And then what's really interesting, and I don't know if you're aware of this, uh, but in 1906, I know there's nobody here that remembers that year, um, I don't think, is there anybody? No. Um, there was a gentleman named Reginald Fresenden, does that name ring your bell? Bill Mike um, Reginald Fresenden. And Mr. Fresenden was a 33-year-old university professor, and on Christmas Eve, he hooked up a microphone to a new kind of generator, and for the first time broadcast a voice over the airwaves. And it actually, that was the very first AM, AM, which the younger folks don't know what that is, but the AM radio dial. That's when the very first broadcast was Christmas Eve, and he read Luke chapter 2, and the very first song that was played on the AM radio waves was O Holy Night. Now, I just think that's kind of a cool thing to know about, about Christmas. And in fact, he started out with that, that great part of Luke that we all know, and, and we'll hear many times through the course of this next uh, month, the next 23 days. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken by the, uh, the entire Roman world. That, that's Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And so this gentleman in 1906 picks up his violin, plays this song, and that's the first song that was broadcast. Now, we've got a couple different major scenes here, one on the piano, and there's one you'll be able to see next week after we put the communion table back. But when we look at the, the, the idea of the Christmas scene, the major scene itself, I, I think we probably do a disservice, and I mentioned this last week as we watched uh, the birth of Jesus in the adult ed hour. And just to be reminded that this is not easy stuff. Uh, the beauty of what a child brings is, is easy, but the idea of so many different aspects. I mean, first of all, a teenage girl, a teenage girl was pregnant, and she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit, uh, with a dad, with a dad to be sort of the, at least a stepdad, and Joseph, who you know, was ready to marry this gal. And you just think about all the things that would be just around that story alone. And then we get to Christmas Eve, as we traditionally celebrate it, and we know that they traveled to, uh, to this place, to the inn, on the back of a donkey. There was no room, remember that part of it. Uh, but we, I think we forget the fact that it was actually probably about an 80-mile, at least, 80-mile journey, which is like a little farther south than from here to Columbus, which is like, that's, when you think about that, and I've not been pregnant, but I'm thinking that if I was pregnant and, and at nine months riding on the back of a donkey would not really be uh, someplace that I think we, we would want to be. Uh, and then you find out when you get to the end, and we make it all sanitized and pretty, more likely the end really wasn't really an end. Uh, it was an adobe building of sorts. And so we sort of believe, based upon our studies, that um, Jesus was born in a cave, probably, literally, opening to a cave. And, 
It's like, in all of the wrong reasons, that's not where you would give birth, right? If you're a, a child, a parent of, of a child that's going to be newborn. And I only remember a little bit of that because in both of our biological children, Sarah and Emma, uh, it was, uh, it was C-section, so it was a whole different kind of experience, even though we had practiced the Lamaze method and all that, and I was ready to, you know, stand back and catch kind of thing, but that, Probably not, and, and then in both cases it was like, no, you just basically make the appointment show. Well, in the first one we made the appointment, the second one was we thought we were going to deliver, she was going to, was going to deliver in March, and anyone who knows Emma, uh, we just, she just didn't wait. And so in January on a cold Saturday morning, when uh, nothing could move because of freezing rain, um, she was born in National Samaritan. But just the messiness of all those things, and if you think about your own stories of, of uh, what childbirth maybe you've seen or experienced or been around, you know that it's not something simple. And so in that, I want to lean into what I think is a really interesting look at this particular carol this morning. But before I start, let's pray. Uh, God, we thank you for this time of year, because we need it. We need to be reminded once again, even though it's a story we hear every year, just month, 12 months later, we need to be reminded. In fact, God, we need to be reminded almost every day, literally maybe even every hour of every day of your provision and your care. And so as we lean into these stories of looking at these great hymns and the impact that they've had upon your church for literally centuries, may we this morning maybe see it anew. And God, I know there are people pushing through things because they're here this morning. And so use these words to encourage us. Use the words that we're going to look at in Scripture, look at the words that comes out of this Christmas uh, hymn, particularly O Holy Night, how in that there is something for each of us. And in our messiness, and in our brokenness and in our needfulness, God, show up. Send your Holy Spirit to encourage us in that, that we would know you and that we would experience you and we would have faith in you and confidence in you. So no matter what we're facing, whatever it is, God, we know that you're there to, to provide and protect. So God, this morning, just uh, send your Holy Spirit now to guide us and instruct us. Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking on flesh as we celebrate these next few weeks and coming into the neighborhood and allow, allow it to be something for each of us individually this morning. And we just pray in your most precious name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. So let's look at the lyrics again real quick. In the first stanza goes, O holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt his worth. Now think about this. You're not a Christian. You're, you're a poet. And so you, you read the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, and these are the words that sort of roll through your mind and you put on paper. But what I think is really interesting here is this next verse. Um, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel voices, O oh, night divine, the night when Christ was born. I always want to pull out here this, these first two lines here. The, 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 the author, the lyricist, writes this. A thrill of hope that a weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. I mean, if you think about even the state of our world today, if you think about how weary some of us are, uh, some of us are really weary because we were up late last night watching the game, right? Uh, others of us were, that was on top of having come in and, and tried to get the church ready uh, to, to, for, for the Advent season. But I want to pull back a little bit and look at a story because we, this is again why I'm challenging you that you need to be reading God's Word. And I'm trying to create every, use every creative tool in my book and in, in other people's books to help you get this Word of God in front of you. Because there are things in this book that will encourage you in the season of life that you're in. Now where I want to go this morning is a book called Lamentations. Has anybody read it? Have you looked at it? It's an old book. It's in the Old Testament. Again, if you want to pull out your devices and take a look at the you version you'll find uh, just to lean into this morning because Lamentations is written by the prophet Jeremiah and Jeremiah is an interesting prophet because he, he walked around town a lot in, in sackcloth and ashes wailing for his people to find uh, their return partly because the, the temple had been destroyed Jerusalem had been sacked the Babylonians came in and so God's people were looking for something new and fresh and so I want us to look particularly at, at and it's interesting, so use a little bit of my, my, my seminary training here. So you'll see that the book of Lamentations is five chapters. And what's interesting, and this is a style of writing, 
chapters one and five are sort of bookends to the story. And then there's a, you'll see if you take time to read it, and I would encourage you, even this week, is maybe something each morning, just to take a look through the, the book, take the whole week and move into it. But you'll see that when you move from chapters one and five to chapters two and four, they mirror, mirror similar kinds of things. And then when we get to chapter three, there's something that's in the middle of the book, literally, that, that the prophet wants us to see. And something that we hang on. And something he was trying to offer, and, and again, trying to put it in the context of a, of, a, of, of literally a, a you know, 586 BC kind of person who's just lost his church, he's lost his community, the, the bad guys are in charge, and so there's something here that, that the prophet wants us to see, and so let's look at this. Uh, this is Lamentations chapter 3, verses 20 through 26. I will remember them. And if you read back a few verses, you'll see he's going to remember the messiness of his life. The things that he's experiencing, he's going to remember. He says, I'm going to remember those things because and my soul is going to be dad and downcast within me. Because I'm remembering these bad things, these bad things that have happened to me and my people. And then he goes on to say, yet this I, what? Call to mind, which means he's going to remember this. He says, I'm going to bring this forward to me in a very serious way. And therefore, I have, what? Hope. hope. I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For what? For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. And then this great word, this series of words here, great God is your faithfulness. Do you recognize another hymn there? Yes. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope, whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good, it is good to wait, it is good to wait. I want you to hear that. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. I mean, one of the biggest issues I think we have as a culture, even as a church, is we're just too doggone busy. Our lives are too full, there's too much that's on our schedules, and we don't have time to wait on God. And so this morning, what I want to hope to bring to you is actually the hope candle, as we call it, the first Sunday of Advent, is actually a, a better understanding of who Jesus is. And I know you know these things, but again, we need to be reminded. That's why we celebrate the holidays like Christmas. So I'm going to give you three things. Because you see, a new day with Jesus brings this. First of all, it, it brings, number one, exactly what you need. Every morning, this morning included, brings you what you need. Now, I want you to understand there's a difference between a need and a want. You may want the new iPhone. You may want the new cool, coolest, like, I don't know what this new creature is from Star Wars that's coming out. It's all the rage right now that all the, all the kids want because it's the new, the new uh, Ewok uh, for this, this new movie that's coming out. Um, but sometimes you've got to preach these things to yourself is that you, there are a lot of things that you want, but there's only something that you really need. And actually, the, the writer here uh, of Lamentations is saying, look, you only need one thing, and that is it understand that God's faithfulness is great and he's going to provide for you. Even where we've been the last five weeks talking about leading generously, the whole point was that to help drill down and understand that it's not about uh, anything other than who you are and what God's required to equip you to be as a person. Now, it, the, the psalmist said, or the, the prophet says this in 324, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, Therefore, I will, I will, one more time, I will, will you wait for him? Will you wait for him? I mean, that's sort of what we do with Christmas, right? I mean, we set up this journey over 25 days. We light the candle each week, another candle. And then we, we sort of lean into the story one more time. To be reminded of God's, and we're going to get a chance to celebrate that here in a moment, this idea of why Jesus came was to offer us life through his, his sacrifice on the cross. The thrill of hope. The weary, weary world rejoices. Now, it's interesting, just this, this statistic, is that according to people smarter than me, you can live 40 days without food. And we, we sort of know that. You can actually uh, live eight days without water. And you can live four minutes without oxygen. But I'll tell you what, none of us can live more than a few seconds without hope. If we don't have hope that God's going to show up in the midst of our messiness, 
then it gets all over. All that we're trying to do in life is going to fall apart. And so that's why we need to stop one more time. Because too many times in our culture today, we put hope in the wrong places. We put hope in the stock market. We put hope in a company. We put hope in a person. Uh, we need that to see very clearly. And, and again, we're going to celebrate it here in a moment. It's very fitting that on this first day of Advent, we're going to take communion together. Be reminded that Jesus took on flesh to move into the neighborhood so that he could offer himself up as a sacrifice for each one of us. So each one of us can have a fuller life than we can ever possibly imagine. And you see, there's a responsibility. So even the past series we've been in about leading generously is about equipping ourselves as individuals to be all that God desires for us. Okay, let's look, on, look here at another scripture. Paul, we think it's Paul, maybe I've been Luke, but in Hebrews chapter 10, look at this. The, the author says this. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Again, for those of us that have watched that series we just came out of, the idea of where Ray, the, where he was moving in, in a restored relationship with his daughter, or with Frank as he was leaving the comforts of the executive suite and giving it all out to move in to do what he realized was probably what his life was all and purpose to men, meant for to begin with, which is to mentor some at-risk kids. To mentor some kids whose view of the world isn't ours. All you have to do is, is talk to a couple of our teachers, yeah, talk, talk to Linda and Sean, talk to Robin and others who, who have been in the class, who were in the classroom, and just talk about the messiness of what our students are pushing through today. Talk to our teens and ask them the messiness that their teen, their teen friends are pushing through. And so that's why it matters so much about what we're trying to do as a church. As we think about a church that wants to love God and love others, and we want to do it without limits. Uh, let's keep pushing pushing in here. I mean, it's interesting, one of the stories that, that we know out of the Old Testament is the story of the manna. Uh, it's a story of where the Israelites are dependent upon, in fact, it's a kind of a crazy story uh, that just about how the Israelites are never happy. And they're always whining, and, and particularly in, after the book of Exodus, as you read the story, read in the book of Exodus, and you read their journey out of, of bondage, in Egypt, that they're out there and, you know, that they're, oh my goodness, life is so, so bad, you know, and they just don't trust that God's actually going to show up. And so God, I just, it's an interesting way to look at it. It's like, if you were God, how would you treat these people? Because they just don't seem to get it. Um, and this idea of manna, and what's interesting in, in the story of manna is the manna only came day in and day out. It only came each day and it was only good enough for that day. So you couldn't go out and pick it up and save it for the next day. And there was a reason for that because God wanted his people to understand that they needed to depend on him to get to the next day. And yet in our American sort of commercialized lives, we don't do that. We don't do that. Even each week as we sat down here, we do the Lord's Prayer. And that's literally why the, the writer, why Jesus talks about, give us today our daily bread. If we really look at what that word meant, it was really the idea, the idea of manna, of provision, of sustenance. And to realize that God may only give us enough for the day because he doesn't want us to squander it. He doesn't even want us to hoard it. And that's what we tend to do. So again, the whole series we just came out of as we come into Advent is this idea, are we willing to give of all that we are, trusting that God's going to show up? And you've demonstrated that a little bit. I mean, I think it's incredible that this community, although I don't think we've hit our, our potential, the ritual gifts. It was incredible to see. We've been there, I've been involved with it since since three years ago when it started. And I remember on the, the victory night as we celebrated that we raised three hundred and seventy five dollars that year. And there were seven of us at the foundation that celebrated that. I'm going, like, really? Um, and I think totally the community raised about sixty five thousand dollars. I mean what's incredible to me is that even Kingwood just announced that they got a, a million dollar gift this week. And yet in the in the announcement of that um, I know that they tried to use the Richland Gives resource opportunity, and they, were, and they even had a gentleman matching their gifts. Or even North Central uh, had an opportunity where a gentleman from Cleveland, I think it was the same gentleman, offered a $10,000, up to a $10,000 match, and yet they only raised $7,000. And I, I wonder, as Melinda and I were at their Christmas banquet last night, how many of even those that received their, their check couldn't have written a check for $25 just to say they wanted to be part of it? You see, we have to think about those kinds of things. We have to understand that there's things that God, that God wants to do for us, but we sometimes get lost in what, he, in what he's offering us. And we get lost in it because 
because of what our marriage may need today, because it may be weak or it may be strong or we, physically or emotionally we may be that, or we may have lost our way. Um, we need to see that God is already in the tomorrow. He is the lifter of our heads. And so let's keep going here. So the second point is that hope, the hope is to keep going. And literally, we get that, that we, we are encouraged each day, whatever you're pushing into, whether it's, you know, it's, it's financial or it's physical issues. I mean, even our, our dear sister, Ethel, I just, I learned so much sitting with her Friday afternoon uh, of just the resiliency of a person who, who she says, well, I, it's just where God's got me. I mean, that's my par paraphrase. Because I don't know how many of us would wake up on a Friday morning thinking that you were going to push into the day, into your little, your little world of your home and the things that you normally do, and to realize that within 12 hours you're going to be sitting in a space that's not yours. With all sorts of people that are going to tell you how things are going to work. Um, that's humbling. And yet, in the midst of that, even though it's humbling, it's this idea that we individually have to keep going. So again, why I encourage you to, to just pen a quick note to her, early Christmas card, just to, to, so that when the mailman shows up, he's got a stack that big, that it's like, what's going on? I mean, and let her maybe share with her roommate, Helen, and others about the generosity, not just of money, but of time and resources of a church that she, she told me she joined this church just after her husband's death. 1983, and how this church has ministered to her, and yet, I dare say, she hasn't been in the building in, in a long time, and yet, I know she's faithful, because I see the envelope that comes in the mail, I know that our deacons are faithful to her, and so it's just in those moments, and that's just one example of somebody we know, but there's so many other people like her, even younger people, that need to know that kind of encouragement of the kingdom, because you see, it's this, from Lamentations, let's go back to Lamentations for a moment. The Lord is good to those, read with me, whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks Him. It's that idea of being unswerving. It's, it's that idea that even this, this thing that we need to depend on. Uh, we need to, we know that in our world we tend to let go of hope in, in exchange for fears. We tend to let go of fears. We don't want to hold on to hope. Too many times, let go of hope, we, we profess it, but then we immediately grab onto anxiety and onto fear. And then we let go of the truth of God, we hang on to other fears. And so that's again why being in the Word and looking at this amazing book of lament. I mean, the word lament means that when life sucks, you're, you're trying to tell God it sucks. And you know, He knows it does, but, but actually the prophet's given us a model that, you know what? I don't like where I'm at. And you know what? It's okay to tell God that because he's your Heavenly Father and he wants you to know that. And so then this third point, real quick, as we move through the morning, the simple idea is that the help you're seeking, uh, that Jesus wants to be there. And he wants to be there in a real way for you. And it's this, this next verse in Lamentations. Uh, Lamentations 3, verse 26. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. There it is again. Just to see it. To wait quietly. And, and I dare say, I know in my own story, I, I've started a journey over the, since November 1st where I've been very intentional about my mornings. And it's hard about how I start my day. It's hard to sit there in quiet. It's hard to sit there and focus, not on the list that's ahead of me, not on the emails that are popping up on my, my devices, but really sitting there and hearing God say, this is what I have for you today. Because we need to wait. We need to wait quietly. Sometimes you have to wait for it. It's, it's an amazing difference. I mean, think about it. Just a couple quick stories from Jesus. I mean, Lazarus is dead for four days. In fact, I like this. If you want to look at the King James Version, it actually it says, he stinketh. I mean, Lazarus is so dead that he stinketh, the King James Version tells us. And then Jesus raises him from the dead. It's the difference of, of just waiting on God. Or how about the woman with an issue of blood for 12 years and is healed? She had to wait 12 years for God to show up. And then the story about the 38-year-old man who, who waited day in and day out because he was paralyzed for God to show up. And, and Jesus shows up and heals him. So for us, we need to see that there's this amazing difference that one day comes. So it's back to that, that stanza there in, in the, where it's... That new and glorious morning, there is a new day coming. And the one thing that's, that's true about these three stories is that it was all about an encounter with Jesus, the risen God. 
that living in the darkness of the night, we need to understand there's a new day coming. When we sing other hymns through this amazing time of the year, we, we, we are reminded, you know, the cattle are lowing. I'm not sure what lowing is, but when the cattle are doing that, they're waiting. Why? Because the poor baby, the baby Jesus sleeps. But, we, we, but he sleeps because we're reminded that Jesus is born. You can have hope, and it may not be what you want, but it, it may be what you need. And then finally here, in, in Paul's writings to, to the church of Rome, here in Romans 13, Paul says this. The hour has come for you, for you Christian, for each of you, and I can call you all by name, to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And he goes on to say what? The night is nearly over and the day is almost here. We need to know that. Just like the sun came up this morning, we know the sun has risen. We know that he's coming back. We know that the author of this song knew, knew his story a little bit, and yet he really wasn't even a Christ follower. And yet he leaned into to offer us something that will help us better understand his purpose for us. And so this morning as we think about this journey to Christmas, even though there's not snow outside, it doesn't look a lot like Christmas outside, May these words of this particular song and the songs we will sing together over these next few weeks remind us of God's amazing love for you. And yet there's that anticipation that we need to have. So this morning if we could join together in singing hymn number one, Come Thou All Unexpected Jesus.